Hello, welcome to Crownsman Energy. I am your host, Jared Downey. Welcome to the show. We're going to be covering something new for us and something new for Alberta. Alberta, we're going to be covering the lithium industry and we're going to feature E3 Metals. Chris Dornbos will be joining the show. Uh, he is the CEO and president of E3. So we're going to be covering what they are up to as a company and what the industry outlook looks like. Obviously, we're going to be seeing a huge demand. So please stick with us for this uh, very, I, I would say it's, well, it's an important to learn about their company, but also to learn about the industry. Before we do that, I'm going to hand it over to Gowdy for our sponsor of the day, and we'll get into the interview with Chris. First up, we have MNP bringing us question of the week. Today, we have Sean Moorfield. He is head of business analysis at MNP. And today's question is, what is the one thing you would suggest companies do to increase performance and improvement? Yeah, so if there was one thing and one thing only that I could do with the business to improve operational performance, it would be this. I would ensure that every single employee in my organization understood what they needed to do in order to be successful on a daily basis. I would also have a member from my management team follow up with them no less than twice a day. One of the biggest things that we see in business is that battles are won and lost on a daily basis, and most organizations face one of these three challenges. The first is that employees simply clock in, clock out, no real understanding of how well they did. The second is that the business itself doesn't understand what success looks like. Sure, they might understand schematically that the project needs to be done at this time with this budget, but they don't really know how well they're tracking. Which brings me to my third point, which is that businesses don't have a good method for evaluating how well they are performing relative to their expectations intra-project or intra-week. They rely too much on reactive measures like your financial statements, which are fantastic, but it's too late in the game and the battle has already been won or lost. Thank you, Sean. You can contact Sean at sean.morefield at mnp.ca. We also have Savannah Equipment. Are you working on pipelines, oil and gas projects, renewable energy, or LNG and need to save some cash? Well, Savannah Equipment has industrial pumps, electrical equipment from motors to transformers, and even surplus pipe and much, much more available now. You can visit them at SavannahEquipment.com where you will find more equipment every day. We also have PowerZone Equipment. When you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas pipelines, dewatering, or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit PowerZone.com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems, no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with PowerZone. Visit them at PowerZone.com. And last but not least, we also have SolarSet. Introducing the SolarSet Fold, the new foldable frame solar system brings power to your residential and commercial property and can be shipped worldwide. Like all SolarSet products, the SolarSet Fold comes turnkey, pre-assembled, and is easily transported and installed. Learn more about the SolarSet Fold and their full line of amazing solar systems at SolarSet.com. All righty, those are our sponsors. Thank you very much, Gowdy. Okay, Chris, welcome to the show. Good to have you here. Um, we've got a lot to cover today, so, so thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Um, I think to just kick off, you know, I, I, obviously there's lots to get in with, with E3, but um, I just kind of, can you give us that picture of the Alberta lithium industry or I, I kind of until this point lack thereof? Yeah, I mean, I would say at the, at the moment, the lithium in industry is nascent. Um, and we're pretty excited to be leading the charge and developing something here uh, in Alberta. So effectively, what we've done is um, look at creating an industry on the backbone of oil and gas. And I think this is why it's so exciting in Alberta. There's a couple of companies uh, like us trying to do the same thing. I think we're definitely leading the charge on an industry that produces lithium out of uh, an old oil reservoir here in the province um, that is loaded with lithium. It used to be a historic oil producer, was actually discovered in 1947 by uh, ExxonMobil. And so we're pretty excited to be developing this uh, for Alberta. I think there's a, you know, the, the oil industry is uh, in a bit of a slump here locally. And what we do operationally looks very similar to an oil and gas company. So we're able to capitalize on some great skill set here in the province, um, a great social license, uh, and a province that's industry focused on something very similar. So great place to be. 
I was just doing a mining conference for CAM and that social license aspect is just, it's obviously a huge topic of discussion um, globally. Um, that, I mean, that must've removed so many roadblocks uh, developing your company, just having that, that, that local support uh, almost province wide. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in the early days, getting um talking about lithium uh was a bit challenging but with um you know an understanding of how this is going to be produced the province has really gone behind it um the opportunity for creating a lot of jobs is there um even things like the drill company that might put our wells in in the future for the production of lithium would be the same drilling company that an oil and gas company would hire and that sort of follows through the entire value chain of the operations here in the province. So yeah, absolutely. Some very excited people, I think here locally. Um, and that garners a social license uh, as well as, you know, the, the industry, the oil and gas industry has been around in the province since the forties. So the interaction between industry and the locals, you know, we're South Central Alberta, it's farmers fields and the interaction between those farmers generally and between the oil and gas industry, there's a well-established system. Yeah. There's a lot of respect. And, um, you know, that goes a long way for, for this industry as well. There's, there's a lot of things I want to get into with, the, with E3. You know, you've got, you're developing a proprietary technology. Um, and and I, I definitely want to cover that. So I'm, I would think that that's going to be part of the reason that the industry has been held back. But why has, why was it just, is it just demand that, that or lack of demand in the years prior that, just didn't open up that opportunity in Alberta for lithium? Yeah, there's a couple of factors, I think, that really contributed to it. Um, the demand's obviously the big one. In, you know, prior to the lithium ion battery uh, for electric vehicle use or for the, the battery itself, lithium was mainly used for greases and ceramics. Not a big market, 50 or so thousand tons, probably historically. Um, with the lithium ion battery, and it's sort of dominance now as the leading technology for, for electrical storage, especially mobile style electrical storage, um, the demand for lithium is skyrocketing. And with more and more electric vehicle companies, or sorry, uh, automobile companies getting into electric vehicles, um, you're seeing that, that those demand projections uh, increase even more um, with the commitments of all of these companies uh, growing their electric vehicle fleet. And, and the raw material uh, has never really been produced commercially for batteries. Mm -hmm. And that's an advantage that E3, and we'll, I, I'm sure we'll talk about that later on. But as it is for Alberta, you know, when, you, when the market was so small, there wasn't, it wasn't necessary to develop more resources. But now with this extreme, extremely expanding market, um, it's opened up opportunities. And Alberta is one of the largest uh, holders of lithium resources. We've got an absolutely massive opportunity here locally um, with, with the amount of lithium that the province has. And so the combination of that uh, has led to what E3 um, is developing. And with all of these things, you know, processing technology, if you're making a, a mineral of some sort, there has to be a processing technology. And the real advent to make this economic has been the technology that E3 has pioneered. Mm. And we call it direct lithium extraction or DLE is the kind of the catchphrase for it all. Uh, but E3's technology specifically has been developed to work here locally in Alberta on brines. We think it'll work across the globe, but really developed here focused on Alberta brines. Right, and it's, um, it, yeah, let's, let's jump into E3 a little bit more. Can you, can you give us a little bit of backstory about the company or, you know, maybe some milestone, just sort of set up, you know, who we're talking about for someone who doesn't know who your company is? Yeah, sure. E3 was founded by myself um, in 2016 and really founded on this opportunity. So we, we went out and we staked a bunch of ground here in Alberta that we knew had uh, historic lithium concentrations. Uh, we, we went and tested those, confirmed that, that that was real. We ended up putting about 7 million tons of resources together um, under 43-101. And then really at that point, the company was at a crossroads because Developing these brides in Alberta, I mean, they're being produced on the back of oil. The aquifer that we're, we're researching and developing here called the Leduc is very well understood. It's been producing since the 40s. ExxonMobil discovered it and it started the oil rush. So that sort of side of the project, the normal 
expiration and development that a company needs to go through, we didn't. Um, what we had to focus on was getting this technology that we developed to a, to a commercial point. And that's what we've been doing for the past three years. So we really shifted focus in 2018 to becoming a technology developer. And while the value for us is still in producing a lithium product, still you know producing minerals, um, the technology to uh, capitalize on that has been the focus for the company for the past three years. When you were when you were starting, you know, let's say let's say a year before you you know you went went all in to start starting this company up, um, did you have an understanding that that would be the case that it would be more of a technology focus as opposed to uh, the actual looking for the resources? Yeah, no, we we pivoted. We started the company as an exploration company. Um, generally, exploration companies don't develop technology. But when we looked at the landscape, we wanted to come up with a, a process that enabled um, lithium extraction from these brines. And when we looked around at the, at the uh, other options, and there, there are not that many out there today um, that enable the direct extraction of minerals from these brines, uh, we saw a gap. And we were working with the University of Alberta here locally already on a project, research project, uh, that was sort of like the plan B, really, to say, hey, how can we get this mineral out of the brines? And a lot of people were attacking the problem from how do we clean up the brine, get everything out, and, and leave the lithium, and then we can process the lithium. And that's generally how evaporation ponds work. And that was sort of the mentality of the processing out there. And we threw the challenge uh, to these researchers to say, can you just get the lithium out? Mm. Can you not go at it from trying to take everything else out um, and then get the lithium in? What they came up with within the first year seemed so revolutionary to us that we decided to invest further in it. And that investment has paid off now in a a technology that we're uh, looking to commercialize here in the next 12 months. It demonstrated anyway to, at a pilot scale level. So, yeah, the I'm just curious, Chris, when you do something, when you go in, I mean, I I'll use myself as an example. I'll come in and we're we're trying to uh, create processes with our own own companies, and I do not use Excel spreadsheets. I'm absolutely terrible at it. So I, I come in and I say what I want, but I really don't understand. I know the end result. Do you do you have a did you have some understanding that it could be done? Or was there was there a year of research where it really was looking in the dark and trying to find a, a new way of doing it? Yeah, it was. It started off as like a blank slate. You know, we we weren't just developing our own. We were testing um, other third party vendor options that are out there. OK. Um, and we just we just weren't satisfied with the results that we were getting. Uh, but it didn't take the research team long. And, you know, there's. Lithium is a very specific element on the periodic table, and it it works in batteries for a very specific reason. And the the technology that we've developed to take lithium out of these brines is not that far, not that dissimilar from the technology that batteries use, the cathode technology. Oh, and so there's a lot of research into technology out there that we could you know base this upon. So it wasn't completely in the dark. Um, but the technology we developed has advanced now to the point where at the time it wasn't even conceived of being uh, a potential or a possibility. So where does that sort of leave you right now as, as a company, um, you know, to sort of bring it up to date, uh, you know, you know, the type of investors you have, um, the interest in the company sort of, where is that part of it at? Yeah, we've, uh, you know, that's something that has also grown, you know, the, the company was founded and started effectively from nothing. We took it public in 2017. Um, you know, and at the time, there was a, a pretty strong lithium market, and that faded away for a bit in 2018. And there's about two years, a little over two years of a pretty bear market for lithium. And so, you know, we, we did pretty good considering we got uh, some smaller government grants uh, on the research side to develop the technology. Um, we, we grew a small but very loyal shareholder base um, through those years and, you know, building a company and really just delivering on what we said we were going to deliver on. And, and that shareholder base has, has grown um, over the past, you know, from 20, I'd say 2017 to, to 2020. And then more recently, 
you know, a lot of the predictions in the market on for lithium products, electric vehicles, that sort of thing, um, those have really started to solidify. People have been talking about this, this bull market for lithium for years, and now you're actually starting to see signs that that is coming to fruition. And all the automobile companies are committing to electric, electrifying their fleet, and that's real, and all based on the lithium battery. So that's driving this home now. And so we saw, you know, a, a lot of attention to E3 story because we've, you know, we have a solid foundation now. We've spent the time to build a good solid resource base. We developed a technology that has been demonstrated to work. We worked with a major partner to get that to the point where it is now. And, and now we're, you know, developing this towards a commercial operation. So the shareholder base has certainly grown significantly over the past, I'd say eight to 12 months. Um, and, uh, and that's been good to see. And, you know, we're bringing in more institution investors now and, and growing that base, which is incredibly important for us to get to the next stage, which is, you know, building a commercial operations here in Alberta. You know, actually, I want to touch on that a little bit, Chris, is the is is that shift, because I know that is a sort of the progression that happens, you kind of end up with these retail investors that sort of get things off the ground, but then you have to, is that, uh, I guess, very simply, how important is it to make that transition to those institutional investors start to come on board? I think for a company uh, like us that is aiming to produce a final product and grow, to that stage, it's it's incredibly important to bring in, you know, attract the institution um, funds, attract their the their attention, um, and you know we do a lot of outreach to funds that we, you know, we're not quite in their in their realm of right. of funding yet um, to set the stage. So you build those relationships because um, every fund has a mandate, and some mandates are you know retail early story all the way to, you know debt financing for the construction of your commercial project. Right. And so, you know, we've, we've always been very strong at engaging on all levels, understanding that some of those institution investors, you know, we're not in, in their, in their real house yet, but we will be. And so they, they get to know us. So that's a big part of what we're doing. And, and so you see them come in slowly, but surely. And as you advance the project, you, you meet their, their minimum hurdle. And then, you know, if they've really liked the story and they've gotten to know you and the management team, then they start to come in, and so that's that is now started for E three. Yeah, that that which leads to that that sort of you know forward thinking, you know that eat and dream where you've got you know you have got your startup where you're first going, but then so how quickly for you and I I just mean even you personally or your, sort of your core team start developing those relationships, knowing that in a couple of years you'll need to have you don't want to start that relationship two years from now and now. Mm-hmm you know, the funds don't come in for another two years. So how quickly did you start to right off the bat sort of develop those, those forward looking relationships? Yeah. I mean, we, we've always been uh, being one or two levels ahead of where we are in terms of those discussions. Um, Obviously the focus needs to be on your base. So we spend a lot of time um, focusing on increasing, you know, the, the retail base and, and, you know, discussing the story and, and getting the information out. Um, but yeah, the, the institution side of things started early on yeah. and, you know, it's grown significantly over the past 12 months, but I think, you know, any strategy uh, that a company like us would deploy is, is getting in front of those companies and building those relationships early on. And, you know, from previous work that I've done prior to E3, you know, there was a lot of, of those relationships already built. So a lot of that is going back to them and giving them right. where you're at now, what you're doing, an update on the progress and the story, you know, and, and they keep tabs of, of people personally. A lot of these institutions um, follow people more than they follow stories because companies grow, you know, eventually will grow past institutions wheelhouse as well. Like we'll get too big or we'll fall outside the mandate on the other side. And you know they'll they'll stick with their shareholding, and they'll they'll allow us to go out and find debt financing, for example, to build a commercial project. And and they were there to provide equity, and they don't do debt, and that sort of thing. Um, so those guys will you know they come into the store, they support it, and then they sit on the sidelines and, and they watch you follow some other story. So or some other institutions. So yeah, I mean from all levels, you know, yeah. you you do attack this from all levels when you start something like this. 
the you've got you've gotten grants i i think the one i saw was uh it's right on your website the uh 1.8 million dollar for your pilot plant um you know talk a little i'd like to talk a little bit about that pilot plant um and your testing but i also would just i think it's important because there's there is there's there's all these shifts happening in the energy sector right now um and and I, I think it's important because there's going to be people that are listening, trying to understand how to develop their company. And, and just a little bit, obviously, without digging into the details, but too much, but just that process of sort of presenting yourself as a company that that is going to get that money from, from the government to, to expedite your, your, your goals. Yeah, I think, you know, you build relationships with government, uh, government granted organizations slowly, but surely from an organization. Um, generally, they want to get to know you over time. You know, Alberta Innovates, who provided that, that $1.8 million grant, have funded us twice before at $100,000 level. Um, so, you know, they've gotten to know us. They, we, we, they give us $100,000. We develop that project. We hit all our, our sort of key hurdles with it. We had a successful completion. And then we did a second one. Again, same, same story. We, we successfully completed that project. And that's what they're looking for. So they really want to garner that sort of longer term relationship. Um, You know, the the funds that we received are instrumental for us because this last grant, 1.8 million funds the pilot. Mm. And in terms of E3's growth profile, that's the, the big key, almost pinnacle of demonstration for the company, because what it does is it it takes something that we've conceived and demonstrates it in a scaled down commercial version. And from there, we become more of a standard company that is just developing a project, right? We, we, we're not de-risking a technology anymore. We are just right. simply, you know, going through feasibility stages to construct and then eventually hopefully operate um, a commercial lithium project. So that's, that's an incredibly important goal for us is getting that pilot uh, running. And, you know, right now that grant has been instrumental to helping us. We're also, you know, we're working on the permitting side of things to get a, a machine out into the into Alberta. We already have uh, brine producing to surface mm. um, through the back of oil production today, and we're talking to operators who have been very amenable to allowing us to uh, tap into their waste stream, what they call their their waste stream, which is for us, you know, the money stream. So, um, and then we can we can we don't have to drill wells or or have a big production to just run a pilot we can tap into already existing production so where just to paint me a little bit of a picture where you at right now you have a testing facility you've now got the funds for your pilot and and then of course the next stage would be commercialization so yeah. right now you're are you in between the pilot and the the testing is that right yeah we're you know with it with any technology that you develop whether or not you're developing from scratch or you're you're deploying a, a conventional tech Generally, you want to demonstrate that. So the the first stage for us is, and it's just about scale, right? Like eventually you end up at a commercial scale and you take it from where you are today and you you demonstrate the scale. And and this is the same in any mineral project. If you were a copper project, you would go to a MET lab and they would do some initial testing for you in a small little machine that sits on a bench top. And that's what we were doing last year. Right. This year, what we're doing is we're building that uh, in a bigger system. We've got a flow system running um, and, uh, you know, we're demonstrating it in a bigger scale. And then that's going to be the next scale is is a quite a large what we call a pilot prototype, which is the, what the pilot will actually look like, but just smaller and inside the testing facility. And then that's the design basis for the for the pilot itself. And and. What you're basically doing is in a controlled environment, you're de-risking the operational side of this, right? So that as you grow it, the operations become uh, more and more certain. So when you put it out in the field, you've got all the little kinks weren't worked out so that it works as expected. Um, and, you know, if there always usually are surprises, but you minimize those so that you have a successful pilot. I mean, that's the number one thing is that not just that we pilot, but that's also successful. And the pilot prototype, that the success of that, um, and when we talk about that, announce that in the future, that's a huge indication that the pilot will likely be successful as well. 
Right. You know, you you said it started. You started the company two thousand seventeen, right? Is that, do I have that right? Uh, I went public in twenty seventeen. We founded in twenty sixteen. Twenty sixteen. Okay. Through that time period, I mean, I just when I hear when someone like yourself comes on the show, it, it's easy to look. You know, you look at the numbers, you look at their milestones, and but I mean, I've I've run a couple businesses, so I I know the sort of that pressure and these these things that you're trying to accomplish. Are there are there a couple key moments along the way that you thought this this is going to go? We we actually have what you know whether it was you know getting the right resources or you know the right area, getting the, you know testing um, your <laughs> your technology. Was there a point, even a day, that you went, this this is something worth moving forward on? You know, actually, there's there's quite a few that I can think of. Um, I think the first one that I really remember was the resources. And we had them out within about six months of going public. And, you know, they were much bigger than we anticipated. We, we had done some back-of-the-envelope calculations. Um and we, we, we employed a, a, a consultant hydrogeologist to do the actual resource work. And um, when we got the number back from that person, even, you know, we took a 50% sort of production producibility factor to the resource. The resource is actually double in total lithium in place than we, than we announced. And even then, you know, the first resource was 1.9 million tons. And, you know, it was just, it was so big. We're just, we were so excited. Um, you know, one even more recently is, is a picture that I saw of um, at our lab um, about a couple of weeks ago where they outlined, um, basically they, they took a picture of the Zorbit mature that we manufacture and they, they took a, the, they had a huge container full of it. And that's going to be used for this. For the you know scaling up of this technology is we have to manufacture this material as well, and so to see that was very exciting. I want to jump into the ESG uh, side of it now. You know this the lithium industry is quite quite honestly, Chris, is new for me as well. So I, I'm going to kind of hand it over to you to sort of paint a picture of of what we're looking at from the ESG side and your approach, E3's approach to it, and and just kind of walk in from there. Yeah, I think the best thing to do maybe is to start at the, the the top level, right? Consumer of lithium products is mainly in the future, um, I would say 90% or more consumed by electric vehicles. And you, there's a lot of discussion right now about, you know, the, the footprint of the materials that go into cars, especially in Europe, where the taxes are based on total CO2 impact not just what comes out of the tailpipe so there's a there's an eye on this and and the full impact of of a vehicle and with the materials that go into an ev specifically into the battery which are where it differentiates from a gas powered car um that esg side becomes uh, a pretty important piece of it so um the footprint of what goes into each of the products is incredibly important. So having a look at this from uh, the mining perspective and the materials that go into the uh, electric vehicle batteries, uh, E3 is aiming to stand out from its peers in the space. And when you look at lithium produced conventionally prior to the advent of the lithium ion battery, it was generally solar evaporation ponds, um, and one hard rock mine in Australia. And so the impact on the environment from the east side of things, um, you know, you have open pits or big ponds, you have big surface impacts, you have interactions with the freshwater aquifers. On the Atacama, where the Solars are in South America, is a very dry part of the world with very limited water resources. Um, and from E3's perspective, just inherently to the, the technology we developed, um, it's a direct extraction method. It doesn't require evaporation ponds. And we're obviously, we're not hard rock, so we're, we don't have uh, an open pit mine. We're taking the brine from very deep in these aquifers that's non-drinking water, um, very, very salty. We extract the lithium out in a closed loop system. So there's the surface impact that we have is very minimal. We're talking 3% relative to a solar or mine. Um, 
we have no interaction with the surface water in our process because it's all coming from very deep. It's all within enclosed system. So it comes out of the aquifer, goes through a pipe to the facility where we take the lithium out of the brine. And then we put that uh, brine back into the aquifer directly. And so from that perspective, the, and this is also what governs our, uh, our social license, right? Is that we, we are above our project where we'll be operating, there are farmers fields and they will continue to be farmers fields uh, while we also operate. So we don't have that sort of, that impact on the local uh, industry, um, the local environment. Um, but the big thing that a lot of companies like us get measured on at the end of the day is our carbon footprint. Right. And relative to um, other projects that are out there, E3's aim is to get down to, you know, a net zero carbon emissions. And to do that, we'll be using Alberta technology. And this is one of the things, again, that we stand out. So we can uh, sequester the CO2 that we generate. And how that happens is we build a natural gas fired power plant because 98%, 99% of our energy on this project is electricity. And in Alberta, we can generate that very inexpensively with natural gas, supporting the local economy with hydrocarbons. So we can purchase hydrocarbons. We can burn that in a natural gas power plant, generate all the electricity we need. And then that carbon, it's about 3% of the exhaust of the gas fired power plant, we can put into our disposal stream, into our wastewater and dispose of that into the aquifer. And this is all uh, under design right now. Uh, it is operational in Alberta with another company down the road from us putting CO2 into the same aquifer. So the process has been proven um, here in Alberta. So we're not cutting anything new here. We're just looking at implementing it for our, our particular project. Right. Um, we also have wind in Alberta, a large amount of wind power. And we have a wind farm adjacent to our property as well. So we look at the supplement that um, the total power load with wind. So the two aiming to get us down to zero carbon, I think, when you look at the marketability of this of this product, number one is quality, um, and the DLE, you know, sort of engineered to provide high quality, high product quality. So, you know that that is number one. Um, but I think a very close second will be your ESG uh, impact, especially when you're looking to find the funds to build the project. Um, there's a lot of ESG consciousness right now in terms of where the funds are providing capital. And having that independently verified, which is our plan of working on that right now, the independent verification of our uh, total impact um, so that we can be evaluated by these funds. The, um, now, your, your proprietary system for separating the lithium, um, but there's also, like you said, there's also this, this technology in place that isn't for, for lower emissions and that that's, that's, that is already in place that you're going to use. That must be a help though as well, right? If I'm understanding you right, because you have, you already have examples of where it can successfully be done, which, which helps for governments supporting you and, and socially as well. It, it, am I kind of seeing that right? Yeah. I mean, the, the technology that we've developed, we are commercializing right now and it's, you know, to describe it in its simplest form, it's, it's like a water softener. In a water softener, you have calcium in your water that's causing it to be hard, and you float over some little beads, and you swap out for sodium. So you get a bit of sodium in water instead of calcium, and that softens it. The technology that we developed is the same thing, but for lithium. Um, the difference is in a water softener, when it's full of calcium, you backwash off that calcium and you flush it down the drain. It becomes useless to you. Um, for us, that's the money. That, that lithium that we backwash off of this material is what is now a concentrated solution of high grade lithium. And because the material we developed doesn't, doesn't attract other elements, we get, a, we get a, a very high grade product and all the information on that's on our website. And so that's what I say it's engineered for purity. That's what it really means is that it, it has a very high quantity of lithium with very low anything else in it um, at high concentrations. And because that all happens, uh, in an enclosed system, in, in a, it's a chemical system rather than a physical. So evaporation is a physical, mining is a physical, this is chemical. So we extract the lithium chemically mm. as the first primary step, the primary extraction step. 
Right. And that, that enables everything that, that really, that's how we get the ESG. I mean, it's the, the footprint of this is inherent to the, to the way we do it. We're not really trying to use less, you know, surface impact. It just, it is, it is the way it is with the system. Right. So yeah, it definitely garners um, that interest and that support because when we, when we go to apply for permits and we're saying, we're going to, we just want a small little well pad where we're going to drill a bunch of wells off of, and we want a small facility and that's our total surface footprint with a pipeline connecting the two that's buried underground um, that allows the surface of that to be used um, for, for its original use, which is generally farming. Um, you know, the, the permit application that, therefore is not that complicated from an environmental and regulatory standpoint. Which, which kind of circles back to what we talked about at the beginning. How much, how much of a role or, or how, how many roadblocks did you avoid having things like existing infrastructure, you know, social, you know, there's a, there's a social support com- coming out of Alberta. I mean, I guess an extreme example, would it even be possible in, in some other places uh, to even, to even start the project? Yeah, I think um, I'll put it to this. Way. We have not drilled a single well on this project. Mm-hmm. Um, generally, the biggest cost for a junior explorer, which we're, you know, when we started this, that's definitely what we were, um, is your drilling costs. You know, you, you would see a, a copper or gold company go and raise $20 million yeah. to drill, just to do the drilling portion of their project. We've avoided that, having all the data at our fingertips and having access to the brine coming to surface. Um, so it, it's definitely removed a huge roadblock. I would doubt that you would have explored for lithium in Alberta had you not known it was already here. Right. And, and so that in that way, it's, it's enabled the entire lithium industry, having the oil and gas here first and, and having all of that data collected and all of the drilling completed and all that really expensive work has all been completed for that we can capitalize on and use to grow this new industry in Alberta, which is lithium. As a market, again, you touched on the beginning, but I just wanted to unpack a couple more of these things as the market progresses. I mean, now is there, I, I, and I apologize for a very layman question, but um, (laughs) maybe I'm not the only one asking it. What is lithium's, what would lithium's competition? Is there any way that the demand for lithium goes down. I mean, I from from the outside looking in, I can't see see it possibly happening. It just seems like it's going to be the demand is just going to be driven up like crazy in the next few years. But is there any sort of comp? Is there a flip side to that? Is there another theory? Um, I mean, for as far as we can see, you know, we we obviously follow the market pretty closely. Yeah. Um, I would say that the automobile manufacturers were the missing piece. Two years ago, mm-hmm. because a lot of people were talking about electric cars, but you know it was Tesla, it was some companies in China. There were a couple of companies making one or two. That has definitively changed. Yeah. So now, over the past year, you know GM's big Super Bowl commercial they had out was uh, thirty models by twenty twenty five. You know when you see that level of commitment, um, it's it's going to be hard to go back, and I think that. You know, we are. I was on a phone call with the the Canadian uh, CEO of of Ford and and GM last week, and they are fully committed to this. And that conversation is with the federal government, and we were talking about you know Canada's role and how how Canada's going to play a role in in the development of um, this this emerging market of of electric vehicles and and lithium ion batteries, and then the raw materials that go into it. And so the other side of this is the battery, right? So if the if the electric or the sorry the automobile manufacturers are all in on electric, you know the next risk is is lithium going to be, the lithium battery going to be the winner? And you know from everything that we've seen, if you asked a chemist um, on what element on the periodic table would be the best to do what lithium does, they would point to lithium. It has its challenges. Um, but people have been trying to engineer out lithium for years and have been unable to. It's really, you can think of it like the lubricant that moves the electrons around and, and nothing really does what, a, what lithium does. So 
every new advancement we've seen, new technology that comes out, even the solid state battery that companies like QuantumScape are working on, they're all lithium based still. So, you know, and lithium forms about 10% uh, by, um, you know, quantity of the battery, it's about 10% lithium in each of the different chemistries that people are coming up with. So it is a, it is a consistent product that goes into every uh, battery that's coming out from the EV side of things. And again, that being the market, um, I, there's no signs right now that, that there's anything that's going to compete against the lithium ion battery or lithium salt state. The other thing that I've wondered as you've talked about this interview, um, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time in Alberta going to events and talking to people, having guests on the show, and it's very interesting. I mean, even six, seven years ago when I would go out there and talk to people, just the even even the hard most hardcore oil and gas <laughs> guy out of that area. I mean, he they just have a different tone when it comes to technology. Um, the way the industry needs to progress, the way that Alberta needs to to invest and in, and have other you know companies like yours that are extracting not just oil and gas. Um, what it, I mean, it has it been a drastic change for you? Just and I mean, just going and talking to someone, saying what your company is doing, what you're trying to do, just the response you get from 2018 to 2021. I definitely. Um... You know, the one thing about Alberta is that there's a there's a very big uh, entrepreneurial spirit here um, for you know new technology and that sort of stuff. But it has been for the longest time, you know, not completely singularly focused, but for a large part, there's a big economic ecosystem around oil and gas. So if you're an entrepreneur looking to get into something in Alberta, you might be developing something for the oil and gas industry. But huge advancements in uh, in the world of oil and gas have come out of Alberta. And so there's definitely that spirit here. And I think that, you know, three, four years ago, um, you know, Alberta got hit pretty hard with uh, the price of oil and that really hasn't come back. And the industry has, has been suffering since 2015, 2016. And, you know, it, it survived and obviously like, the, the world still consumes a lot amount of oil and gas, and that's not going to change anytime in the future. No, you know, so there's still there's still an industry here in Alberta for that, but the growth of that industry has been stifled, and a lot of companies have pivoted, a lot of people in their careers have pivoted, and and that has happened in the last three years. So there's a lot more um, sort of uh, interest in in new technology, diversifying Alberta's economy. And so there's definitely been a, a mentality shift um, from that perspective. And, and I've seen that as well, um, for sure, with what we're doing. As we're wrapping up the interview, Chris, kind of outline what, what are the, what's the focus for you? What are the milestones that need to be hit um, for, for your company and your team in the next, in the next three to five, 10 years? Yeah. I mean, the big goal is making lithium in Alberta. Um, in a commercial sense, uh, having a commercial operation producing, you know, somewhere around 20,000 tons of lithium to start. Um, you know, how we get there, really, the first big thing that we're, we plan to do here as soon as we can is, is demonstrate this, um, this direct lithium extraction technology in uh, a pilot system running on, uh, on real brine coming out of a well in Alberta. And, you know, after that, it's, it's, project design and build. So going through those, those stages of feasibility and then detailed engineering design to get a facility uh, under construction. And obviously the, the side of that is funding that as well. So, you know, that's going to be our, our focus, but, you know, that's sort of the, the call it in production of lithium by the five-year mark for sure is the goal. If not, you know, obviously we're hoping a bit sooner than that, but by that five-year mark producing lithium in Alberta, that project at 20,000 tons would be a very small project relative to what Alberta can offer. And not just yeah, E3, but that, E3 yeah. alone, we think we can expand to 150,000 tons. That's the goal. Um, so, you know, seven times growth from the initial project. And that can run in aggregate for 35 years at 150,000 tons. So this is a huge industry for the province. Um, and we're not the only ones. There are other companies that are uh, up, you know, startups that are trying to, you know, follow the E3 model and, and they've acquired some land and they're trying to do the same thing. 
And, you know, that is, that's the entrepreneurial spirit that's yep. here. And I think that, you know, those companies will hopefully be successful as well. And, and we'll have a, an entirely new industry in Alberta um, that has really been built on the backbone of the oil and gas industry. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think that's the big picture. The blue sky for E3 is, is this massive growth in, in a brand new industry. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned some of the other companies that are trying to to do similar things. You know, it's, it's, it's like our show. I mean, I've, you know, I'm, I'm currently working with companies that are trying to get their shows off the ground because uh, it, it raises the standard. It, you know, if Alberta, if there's just one company in there, that's, that doesn't become what Alberta is known for. So I, I am, it's very exciting doing this show. You know, we went very naively when we started the show, a lot of companies came out of Alberta. We thought it was going to be geared more towards oil and gas. And it's just, the shows are coming from everywhere, all different types of topics in the energy sector. So thanks for coming on the show, Chris. I, I, I'm looking forward to following this story. I hope, I hope, you know, as you hit some of these milestones, you can kind of come back on. It really makes it a neat thing to follow for the audience to sort of see the progression. Um, and, and it's, it's clear from, you know, I've looking into your company, there's going to be quite the progression in the next few years. So I hope you come back on to unpack that for us. Yeah, I would love that. I think this next 12 months is going to be massive for the company, um, you know, being fully funded and, and the plans that we have in place right now to, to do the biggest milestones that E3 is going to have uh, that we've had so far are going to be in the next 12 months. So this is very, very exciting. So yeah, it'd be great to come back and tell you how it all went. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Have a great day. Yeah, you too, Chris. Okay. Um, well, thank you everybody for watching. Um, please go check out uh, E3 Metals. That we've, we're going to have plenty of links in their LinkedIn. You can follow sort of their live updates as well as their website that has articles and more information. Plenty to follow. Please follow us um, at Crowns and P is on a lot of our like Instagram handles, and then just look up Crowns and Partners on LinkedIn or on YouTube. You'll we're all over the place. We've got lots of episodes. We're doing two or three a week now, and always looking for more. So suggest your guests. Um, if you've got a company that you want to be that you own or part of that you think should be featured, let us know. We're happy to talk to you. That's at info at crownsman.com. You can just email us directly. Thanks for watching, everybody. We will see you on the next episode of Crownsman Energy.